And we're back. Welcome back, everybody, to the Space for Impact inaugural event. By now, you've already heard from some prominent lenders of this, leaders of the space ecosystem how space is important for Earth. For example, by connecting unconnected people via satellite communications or using Earth observation for climate change or many other use cases, or producing innovative new materials like pharmaceuticals in microgravity. However, none of this would be possible without entrepreneurs pursuing business models that have such positive impact. And that brings us to our first panel discussion of today, the Space Entrepreneurs Panel. We've had a hard time choosing because frankly, there is so many prominent space entrepreneurs around whose companies have positive impact. But I'm thrilled that we found a good selection and it's also a geographic mix as well as a mix of interesting business models. We have my friend Thomas Grubler, the CEO and co-founder of Aurora Tech from Bavaria. We have from right here in Switzerland, from Zoo, Eugenia Balisheva, the CEO of Dot Photo. We have from the Luxembourg outpost of US company Hydrozad, Vanessa da Silva and Albert Abello. From the other side of what we call the Rusty Graben in Switzerland, the French speaking side, we have Fabien Jordan, the CEO and founder of Astrocast. And last not least, we have Agnieszka Lukacek, a senior director of European affairs for US company Planet. Welcome everybody. Guys, all of your companies have positive, positive impact here on earth. And I would like to kick off this panel by understanding what exactly does is. So if you can give us maybe a couple of minutes explaining your business model and precisely how it has that positive impact here on life on earth. Why don't we start with Agnieszka? Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Um, indeed, uh, we do believe that we have a positive impact um, on Earth, on the life on Earth. And this pretty much started with the founders of Planet, who started this company uh, with a mission to um, to to make, uh, as cheesy as it sounds, make uh, make this world a little bit a better place. And um, so we are a mission driven company. Uh, this co company was created not to, you know, uh, not with profits in mind, but uh, with really making an impact. Obviously, we have to make money to sustain what we're doing. So we are a, um, a commercial entity after all. But but the goal here is really to 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 have an impact. Um, and there are different ways that we're doing that. First of all, we believe in transparent planet. We believe that what you you cannot fix what you cannot see so it's very important to have a awareness of what is happening on earth so that we can tackle um those challenges and make um informed decisions we have identified that 13 out of the 17 sustainable development goals can be addressed with earth observation um, and we're trying to do that Therefore, uh, we are working with various governments and various entities around the world to uh, provide our data to meet those challenges. We're working with the uh, UN, the European Union, the World Bank, lots of different NGOs and think tanks to do exactly that. Just recently, for instance, as to give you an example, uh, we signed a contract with um, Norway um, the, and the and FAO. Um, to provide our data to 64 uh, countries that have uh, tropical forests to manage, uh, manage, manage forestry. So what happens is that Norway and FAO is buying our data and then they're distributing it to these 64 countries so that they can really uh, know what is happening with their forests. So this is just one of the examples. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Maybe Vanessa or Albert, if you wanna go next for a couple of minutes. All right, good morning. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, so Hydrosat, um, similarly to Planet, you know, has identified that Earth observation is the key to unlocking um, a lot of value here on Earth. Um, and particularly what we've noticed is that um, while there um, is a wide range of different um, sources of data uh, that are used, um, particularly satellite-based uh, satellite data, um, there's a little bit of a hole um, in terms of thermal infrared, um, particularly thermal infrared that is usable in a commercial application. Um, so in terms of accuracy, revisit time, coverage, um, thermal gives a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and here at Hydrosat, we're trying to harness that. So we're approaching it from two different perspectives. 
On the one hand, our um, team in the US is focused on our flight segment. So we're actually going to be providing that proprietary data ourselves. And the other element of that is the data analytics. And that's the portion that we're working on here in Luxembourg. So based on that data analytics, we are looking right now to focus on two different products. The first one is yield uh, prediction. So being able to say weeks, months ahead of schedule um, with very, very high accuracy, what the yield is going to be. And at the same time, um, irrigation management is also getting quite a lot of, of work on it. So being able to give farmers, um, you know, weekly updates and eventually daily updates on when and how much to irrigate their fields. Um, and both of these products, you know, align really nicely with all of the UN Sustainability Development Goals that um, aim to provide, you know, um, clean water, um, reduce clean water usage. Um, and eventually there's this whole chain um, that, that gets affected. So in terms of being able to provide, um, you know, food, um, uh, in terms of, sorry, to, in order to improve uh, management of uh, food supplies, um, uh, and eventually, um, we are also looking, and Albert might be able to discuss a little bit more later on, um, at doing um, a little bit of work in a couple of other um, products, particularly around wildfire monitoring, drought prevention. Um, the possibilities are endless. So, in addition to the thermal component, um, we are also looking at applying um, a lot of data fusion techniques. So we're also looking at incorporating other data sources, including um, weather forecast. Um, and right now we've, we're under contract with ESA and they are helping us through our research and development for these two particular um, products. So the yield forecasting and the irrigation management. And we're looking to launch our flight segment um, about a year from now, maybe a little bit more. Great, um, thank you, Vanessa. So. We, we have to move on to the next company. So. Um, Eugenia, why don't you tell us how Dot Photon provides positive impact on Earth? Sure. Good morning to everyone. Very glad to be yeah. here. So, Dot Photon um, is an enabler company in this space uh, because when we speak about Earth observation these days, we everyone speaks about data, about uh, how images are great to be a uh, great helpers for us uh, to uh, monitor and. Uh, change for the better land, uh, atmosphere, and marine environment. However, the amount of data is significantly um, left on the side, like we will cope with it somehow. But already today, just by the European Space Agency's Copernicus programs, there are 12 terabytes of data produced daily. And this amount will grow with the requirements of a higher, uh, of a higher resolution or more data points for image of more sophisticated imagery. And as we all know, in the world of media files, the highest quality br brings the biggest file size. And here where a lot of um, companies are stuck because for today's we use a lot of lossy compression techniques which allow to for humans to look at the data and analyze it however with the amount produced are more and more machines looking at images and uh, the existing compression technologies are not suitable for machine vision and this is where dot photon uh, comes to to the light because we use a proprietary compression technology which allows to compress raw image data uh, up to 10 times with no information loss um, we have just uh, i think it's yesterday that this uh, the confirmation of the validation by the european space agency has been published on the european space agency's website so we are collaborating with ESA on the validation of this technology for the space sector. Uh, this tech has been used already widely in biotech, for example. But however, here the requirements and the stakes are higher. Uh, what we think it can bring introducing this compression technology on, uh, on satellite, obviously the optimization of the resources because we can use the same infrastructure to send much more data. Uh, then uh, data is very expensive and will be even more expensive uh, for the transmission and starting of use of cloud. I think NASA has a great example recently uh, how much actually image data will cost. So uh, it's not a very democratic tool. Uh, making it smaller, make it much more transferable, make it more democratic and gives more access to more countries or more scientists or more researchers the Earth observation data. So this is um, what drives us mostly. And um, optimization of the resources is definitely a goal number one for implementing raw image compression. Great. Thank you very much, Eugenia. 
So Fabian, Internet of Things, this obviously it's a giant market, lots of use cases. Maybe you can tell us about some of those which have positive impact here. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Glad to be part of this discussion. So, so few words about Astrocast. We are a satellite operator based in, in Switzerland and in the US. We are operating a fleet of, uh, of, of nano satellites uh, to provide IoT communication services globally. And really the, the goal was to, to you know, extend the coverage uh, to, to the whole planet because today only 10 to 15 percent of the planet is covered by terrestrial networks. So, and, and satellites is the only way you can send data uh, in these remote areas and it's, it is still very expensive today. So this is about to change with, with Astrocast. Thanks to our, our system, uh, you can now connect any devices on the planet that uh, is equipped with uh, our low cost communication module that look, looks like this. So this unlocks not only fantastic business opportunities, but most importantly, it allows us to have a real impact on some of global and, and persistent challenges. Uh, whether we talk about climate change, air or, or water pollution, or even the pandemic, we, we're talking about global issues that need, they need to be addressed with uh, ad adequate uh, tools and, and means. And by nature, a global constellation of, of nanosatellites in low Earth orbit uh, is very well suited to, to have a positive impact on these, uh, on these global uh, major, major uh, issues. So we have many customers who are actually uh, either studying the climate change or uh, directly impacted by the effects of the, of the climate change. We're talking about companies uh, monitoring um, you know, wildlife, uh, tracking uh, migrations of, of animals. Uh, we are talking about companies uh, trying to eradicate uh, bovine disease by connecting uh, livestock, you know, millions of, of animals uh, all, all over. The planet. We're talking about detection and monitoring of wildfires. Uh, it is it's absolutely key to be able to detect a, a bushfire or a forest fire as soon as it starts. Uh, we're talking about uh, weather stations globally uh, or, or, or floating stations like like buoys, environmental buoys uh, on the ocean. Uh, we're also talking about uh, you know cold chain monitoring. For example, if you have to ship uh, a, a vaccine or some some drugs in remote warm areas, you have to make sure it remains cold uh, until it reaches the, the 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 person that that eats that that vaccine. And still today, a lot of vaccines are, and drugs are, are wasted because just because they don't remain cold uh, all, all the way. So this is something uh, that has to be improved. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific, Fabian. Lots of use cases, as we can already tell. And uh, finally, our last guest to present his company, and I think he's going to tell us about wildfires. It's uh, Thomas. Thanks, Rafael, for the invitation to this event and for setting up this panel of these awesome guests. Yeah, we are, although we are mainly started and are still active in this thermal infrared field, we also found out that we need to focus on a very pressing issue, so wildfires. Wildfires are not only uh, caused by climate change, they're also, also accelerating climate change. And although wildfires are a very natural issue um, due to the heating, uh, due to the global warming, they are also now pressing in the northern areas. So we even saw the first wildfires in in I think Sweden last year and so on. So wildfires are really going into areas where it's not so normal and we are helping to manage wildfires in these areas. So um, we provide a, a wildfire service to our customers, which is really one of the uh, quickest one in detecting fires uh, based on mainly space data. So we analyze space data from several satellite systems and try to be the first one to find fires in very large areas as there um, we have customers. We are now also helping in Australia in areas where really no one is at the moment able to overlook the forest and we can then provide a solution to detect fires and detect if they are going, for example, in direction of a city and then really harming someone. Um, so this is our first and main product at the moment uh, we are working on. Thank you, Thomas. And thanks to all of you. I think as the audience can tell, all of you have come up with business models that have tangible, have the potential to have tangible positive impact here on Earth. 
Now, one of the things that we try to do at Space for Impact that we believe in is that to really achieve this positive impact, we have to create an ecosystem of entities who all have that same goal. And that involves you guys, the startups, but it also involves the corporate customers that most of you have. It involves investors and involves the public sector and also academia. So I quickly would like to touch um, for two or three questions on that, the question of building that ecosystem. So why don't we start with the corporates, the corporate customers that most of you have. I'm curious how it is working with them, whether they understand your technologies, whether they're accessible and what your experience has been. So maybe Thomas, why don't I just continue with you? Because I know obviously detecting wildfires, I think you're working, for example, a lot with the insurance sector. So maybe you can give us a couple of seconds how your experience has been in terms of breaking into that customer sector. Interestingly, insurance sector is at the moment not our main customer, although everyone thinks this is the main customer. Um, uh, we have two customer groups on the one hand, of course, the governmental customers and the businesses. So businesses on the one hand, they have a huge forest of uh, like one million of hectares plantage and they are really observing it on their own as they really have a loss in, in revenue if there's one hectare burning. And we're helping, and there it's quite obvious that we they are really looking for the newest technologies and on the edge. And on the other hand, yeah, most of our customers are governmental customers. And what we observed is that these governmental customers are actually not really um, they they don't know that there is the possibility to detect fires from space, or that this could potentially be a very good addition to flying around with a plane and looking out from watchtowers. And so what we experienced is that they're actually quite interested as they like space. I mean, everyone likes space. So it's a very good point to come into it. But at the other hand, you always, we always had to prove it. Um, we were now really several times able to prove it with uh, uh, exact test fires at customer sites and or by customers really reported, we saved them X euros of, of losses. Um, so the, it takes some time to prove it, but I really see that uh, space data, as we now also have the proof, um, we see that there's a huge uh, change in understanding on this topic. Great, I'm gonna ask a similar question to maybe to Vanessa, because I mean, your customers as well, um, I mean, you're working with thermal infrared. I mean, if you arrive at your average corporate, they may be going like, what, what the hell is this? What has your experience been in trying to, to sell your solution and market your solution to corporate customers and maybe any, any lessons learned? So our experience has been a little bit mixed. Um, we've noticed that certain customers uh, are actually very knowledgeable um, and depending on the type of customer, depending on the size of the corporation, um, certain customers, particularly for our yield prediction products, um, are already very well informed. And in fact, some of them even have entire teams and departments in-house um, that have started to try and develop certain algorithms on their own. Um, and so with those customers, our conversations are very different and it's more of a value add. So how can our um, thermal component, you know, enhance the insights that they are already producing on their own? Um, and then on the other hand, we also have different types of customers, um, as, as Thomas was saying, where we actually need to prove, um, you know, the usefulness of, of space data. And that groundwork is a lot more extensive. Um, there's a whole layer of um, educating each other, um, so understanding what our customers' needs are, um, you know, because if we're coming at it from a space perspective, you know, suddenly we need to learn a lot about agriculture, we need to learn about how farms run, um, what issues they run into, and how we might be able to solve them, and particularly they can then learn, oh, okay, you know, space imagery can be useful, and we need to explain that direct impact. So if we put it in terms of the actual end result will be increased yield, um, reduce um, costs that are, you know, uh, tied to irrigation. So not just what less water costs, but you know, energy savings, labor savings. Um, if we can translate it into those terms, then they tend to be, um, you know, wowed by it. But there's this extra layer of education with some of the customers. That's true. Great. Thank you. And I want to switch to one of our other important stakeholders groups, which is the the investors. And you know, I think. 
all of you basically are dependent on on outside investing. I think probably the one who's sort of furthest along in the um, in the financing timeline, if I'm not mistaken, is probably Astrocast and, and Fabien. Hence, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you what has your experience been working with investors? Do they understand what you're doing uh, in terms of space based um, IoT communications and and how do you think about that? Yeah, well, they, I, they, they, do, they do understand what we're trying to achieve. They do understand um, the ambition and, and the impact that we can have. Uh, we're talking with a very wide range of in investors. And, and I have to say that I've, been, I've, I've, seen, uh, I've seen many, especially on, the, on the, you know, the private investors, the family offices, I've seen a lot of them um, being you know, seriously concerned about uh, you know, Global global change, uh, CO2 emissions, and they, they want to have an impact. And we're very happy to 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 have uh, several uh, several investors uh, in in our uh, company that are very supportive uh, of these uh, values and very aligned with our, of our our values. And I think it's very nice to see that you see more and more impact funds are, are active and getting you know, more and more uh, important uh, in the discussions. Uh, not not all of them. Obviously, what still always drives the, the discussion uh, is, uh, is is uh, is the business itself. But now, what we see, we were talking about the large corporates and 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 among the the customers that we we have, we also see that uh, you know some of them are really impacted by by these global issues, and um, they need they need to find solutions. They need to improve the automation, the the predictive maintenance, etc. And they also think about you know, investing uh, more massively in solutions that help them optimize uh, you know, fleet management, uh, that help them uh, avoid driving, avoid sending people in remote areas, uh, driving hundreds of kilometers to, to check on equipment and, and try to, to, to save costs on this and at the same time reduce significantly their, their carbon emissions. Great, thank you. And then finally, another important stakeholder, of course, is the public sector in its in its various forms. And I'm going to ask Agnieszka because I know that obviously Planet interfaces with the public sector at times, and also your your personal history has a lot of public sector work. How is the public sector approach this whole thematic? How educated is it, and, and how much do they care about the, the impact which may come out of space technologies? I think it's getting better and better. Um, there is definitely this wave now where. Um, everybody is kind of realizing that uh, planet, not the company planet, planet Earth is uh, is on fire, um, and I mean fire, quote unquote, meaning that we have to act now <clears throat> in order to make some changes. I mean, you can uh, one of the kind of obvious examples is the European Green Deal. Um, the the biggest priority of this uh, Commission, of the European Commission, is um, is the European Green Deal. So pretty much everything that um, EU is going to be doing, it should be uh, done in a kind of ecological green way uh, to cut uh, carbon emissions to, to, to zero by 2050. And that is really cross-sectoral. So it's not a vertical uh, uh, priority, it's really horizontal. And uh, an Earth observation is gonna be an, um, one of the essential tools for that. So we are actually um, speaking with the European Commission how companies like ours can help. And, and there's a lot of openness um, for, uh, for that discussion. So, so I think uh, uh, governments are really opening up and uh, uh, because they know that they have to act. We were a little bit worried actually that the pandemic is gonna you know, put that in the back burner a little bit because obviously pandemic is, is, is an urgent issue now, but uh, sustainability doesn't stop and pause uh, because there's a pandemic. So we have to act in parallel and that is that is happening for sure. The World Economic Forum is also very much engaged. So there is a there is a light in the tunnel for sure. Great, thank you. And and finally, Eugenia, you can pick any of these stakeholder groups um, we talked about and maybe your experience, how it's been working with Viva uh, well, in the public um, sector. Yeah, so this. actually we are interacting with all of them and I think uh, the common line would be that uh, we saw a huge change in the last two to three years. So when we were pitching the company to the investors or um, to the academia uh, or to some public bodies, um, there was a lot of 
Um, there are a lot of open questions and the need in um, sustainable uh, solutions for the space sector were not, especially for the Earth observation data, uh, were not so obvious. Whilst, you know, uh, for a good example, pitching to the investor, I could spend quite a lot of time explaining the, pro the problem. Now one slide is enough and everyone starts to know the straight away once you just uh, define it. Because uh, with the growth of data, with the growth of companies using this data, uh, and um, there is obviously an understanding in uh, optimization or a need on optimization to manage how to manage it. Very follow-on question: Which which stakeholder group do you think is easiest to work with, and why? Um, surprisingly enough, is uh, probably public organizations like, for example, the European Space Agencies. I think they started uh, to be. Mm, you know, they have to embrace innovation and they, they produce innovation themselves. So um, I think they were probably one of the fastest to start to adopting to this new uh, to this new world where you have to collaborate with startups to get the newest technology as fast as possible. And they have different programs to do so. Whilst with the corporations, uh, sometimes a huge machine. So even if there is an individual will to participate, um, you, you still you need, you need a half of, this, half of the year to bypass the compliance sometimes so just to start working together. So there is a change as well. So things start to get faster. Big corporations start to create the programs for young startups uh, where they can try uh, to use new technologies. Um, but I saw the fastest change probably in the public bodies. Thank you. And I would like to ask one question to all of you, and if, if you can keep it sort of short and sweet in one minute or less, sort of now understanding our goal of building this, this ecosystem of all of these stakeholders to promote, promote space technologies and specifically the potential of space pro, uh, technologies for positive impact, what is one action you think we should be taking? Why don't we start, um, um, we just go back to Eugenia. Um. Well, I think um, the beginning to work on standardization of processes straight away uh, would be a great help actually to establish a better ecosystem because we can end up having uh, a lot of companies uh, producing different things, you know, which don't, uh, there is a bit of lack of interoperability. Um, if uh, we try to structure the process uh, um, straight away since the very beginning, uh, I think uh, we can get faster and better results. Good. That's a good one. Anyashka, what do you think? One action. Uh, <clears throat> Public-private partnerships. I think we're all in this together. Um, and I don't think anybody can um, address these issues alone. And industry has a, ro a strong role to play. Uh, public needs to be open to it. Um, industry can help a lot, but industry obviously to survive needs to also have some sort of revenue. Um, so uh, I think public partner, uh, public private partnerships are the way to go forward. That's another good one. Vanessa or Albert, what do you think? Yeah, so I think um, I would say maybe increasing the awareness of both private and public sectors um, and making them understand the importance of uh, sustainable development. So as an example, this panel session has made us realize uh, the importance of communication between different stakeholders, um, especially from what Virginia and Fabian said, so the importance of uh, facing new challenges. As an example, uh, having increasingly big data sets for a uh, hydrosat, so we can think of uh, better methods of compressing data sent through a downlink, or if we have distributed uh, sensors or data sets coming from different parts of the world, uh, methods for sending them back to our database. Great, thank you. Fabien, I saw you nodding, but um, you can also give your contribution of uh, what do you think the actions yeah. we could take. Yeah, absolutely. So I also believe that we should we should go, we should make more efforts to try to combine our strengths. So I, this is why I think this kind of initiative uh, is, is really is really important. I think if we can combine our, um, our um, different systems, we can bring a very powerful solution. Just looking at the startups and the industry, you know, for one example, if you combine satellite imagery together with measurements on the ground with a, with a network of sensors, this brings more value. It's very powerful to better manage water resources in agriculture, for example. So really spending more time looking at how we can combine the great systems that we've designed. 
Great. And finally, Thomas, what do you think uh, initiatives like Space for Impact should do? What actions should we take to build the ecosystem? I would go a bit broader. So governments always have a big impact on what technologies are developed and where or where we are going with new inventions. Although startups and so have ideas, governments mostly decide which are developed quicker and which are developed faster. And what I would really like to see is that also the invitation to tenders of governments are uh, very open formulated so that governments say there is an issue for this and this problem and everyone can propose solutions which are completely different, doesn't need to be space, does need to be non-space, but it should be completely open to innovation and government should be really open in these public-private partnerships to test new ideas and like go in a experiment with three or five companies and test these five solutions, which are all will be completely different over summer and decide, okay, this is the solution we are going in and not really say already doing in the public private partnership saying this is the solution and we want to go for for a tender there. Right. So that's includes another vote here for public private partnerships, which we all already heard from Anieska. So I hope some of our public representatives um, for the public sectors are, are listening. So we have a few minutes for audience questions and we did receive a few audience questions in the chat. Um, the first one is actually for Anieska and Planet. Anieska, how, if you do this, how do you assess the, the impact um, that Planet's activities have on SDGs? Um, I mean, I think this is, you know, I, I think it's a little bit earlier for assessment. Um, uh, this work, it's a, it's a long-term goal. I think, uh, you know, this is, this is one other thing that we're not going to make um, a sustainable, uh, we're not going to make um, serious changes in, in kind of these sustainability issues overnight. So it's a, it's a, it's a long process and this is something that we cannot assess overnight. I think uh, one assessment that we can do is just the, uh, utilization of earth observation data and 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 uh, procurement of um, earth observation data which is continuously growing so clearly there is a there is a need there is an interest and there is an impact uh, that because uh, these uh, that data is procured that data is used uh, I do want to you know highlight that we're not gonna uh, we're, we're not working here alone so we're not working in silos our data is not gonna you know, uh, change the world by itself. So it's in combination with all kinds of different data sources that need to be fused together um, and working with other partners uh, to make sure that we have the best um, available information um, out there. So um, that is that is something that, again, uh, requires cooperation between public and private sectors. Great. And then we have a question for uh, Fabien and Astrocast. Fabien, where do you see the highest levels of customer interest, I guess, that's uh, from which industries, from, for which use case of, uh, of your product. Yeah, thank you. So, so initially, with the first service that we, we are um, offering, we see uh, the, 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 a massive opportunity in the agriculture and livestock industry, and as well as the, the maritime industry. And then as we launch more satellites and we reach better latency, uh, the, the, the main part of our market will be uh, connected vehicles uh, and what we call a panic buttons application like SOS system, like this, this uh, personal tracker that you can use when you go uh, hiking or that can be used to you know, provide safety to personal. This is a market we can definitely address. Uh, and then, but, but IoT is very fragmented, so, so there's no killer app. We, you have to address several segments. Uh, we're talking about oil and gas, uh, you know, freight and storage, uh, environmental and, and utilities, so that the many segments, the big ones are the, the one I, I just mentioned. Okay, great. The next question is, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, do we think the call to build back better could support sustainability-driven space entrepreneurship? I got to try to make sure that I fully understand this question. I think what that means, I mean, build back better is obviously the slogan of the of the incoming Biden administration. I guess I'm gonna int interpret that in this way. So both in the US where we have a new incoming administration, but also in Europe where the EU is obviously putting together large EU level, um, let's say economic aid packages. Is there something on, on your wish list um, 
what you expect to, or what, what you would like to see from, from governments post pandemic to support your efforts. Um, maybe uh, Thomas, what do you think? I think I already mentioned my wish of the very open tenders in the uh, post pandemic world. And I mean, we should not forget this issue also after the pandemic, we should not forget that we have a climate issue and we should work on, we now learn that this is possible, uh, that we can achieve something and we learn what's, yeah, we really learn what's possible. And I think we can work on this issue. We just need to understand that we have the problem and find a solution. Vanessa or Albert, anything on, on your specific wish list to the, the, the big public entities? So I, I totally agree with uh, what Thomas said. And I think a good example of that is um, wildfire management application that both uh, Thomas and uh, we are working on. So um, I think a good example is the prediction and monitoring of severe droughts. So severe droughts are, are an increasing problem in the earth. Um, climate change experts are telling us that um, this will be one of the main issues in the coming years. So um, space entrepreneurship and the launch of um, space imaging satellites uh, can be of great help to achieve this. Rafael, can I shortly jump in, please? Sure, go for it. We just found out that we can develop a vaccine with uh, the whole world all together and probably have a lot of different vaccines now in the pipeline, which all have very good proofs. I think we could do the same also for climate change. If we say this is an issue and be really open and just develop something, um, we can go in this direction. Thank you. That's, that's, and that's a really encouraging thing to say. Um, Fabien, anything that, that you would like to see from the incoming US administration or the EU post-pandemic? Post well, I think the main points have been uh, highlighted, but uh, I think especially for, you know, for growing company startups, um, the, the support, continuing to, to support the, this initiative by not only injecting uh, money, but uh, thinking about all the, the needs of the typical needs of, of uh, growing, growing startups and, and scale-ups and continue to support this uh, this uh, fresh mind creating disruptive ideas and that can really solve the, the, the persistent global uh, issues that we have in front of us. Great, thank you. Guys, the panel is coming to an end. Um, I would like to thank my five fantastic, oh, sorry, six fantastic panelists from five companies who all have tangible positive impact. Yonerv, Agnieszka from Planet, Fabien from Astrocast, Vanessa and Albert from Hydrosat, Eugenia from Dot Photon and Thomas from Aurora Tech. I think this has been a great discussion despite obviously not having a lot of time. And we have some, I think, really valid ideas we should follow up on, like you know, the, the public private partnerships, the standardization, and the educational efforts. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that during the rest of the Space for Impact event today and tomorrow. It's now 10:49. We have a break, a short break until 11 a.m. Zurich time, and then we will continue.